and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Linda Calhoun, founder and executive producer of Career Girls and chair of the club's International Relations member-led forum. I have a couple housekeeping announcements before I introduce our moderator, International Relations Vice Chair Frank Price, who will introduce our panel on clean water. Our programs are free, however, we would be delighted if you would go to commonwealthclub.org to donate. And special thanks to those of you who have already donated. And for today's program, we're accepting questions for our panel members through chat on YouTube. There's a chat window on the right side of the video window. And to access the chat feature on YouTube, the viewer must log into YouTube, and then you simply enter your email address and screen name when prompted. And now I'm delighted to turn the program over to Frank Price. Frank is vice president of Team Building Unlimited, an interactive team building company that provides communication, team bonding, and business strategy experiences to private and corporate clients throughout the United States. Frank served three years in the Peace Corps in the Ivory Coast, and he is currently on the board of the Northern California Peace Corps Association, where he organizes special events, implements school-based programs, and promotes outreach to the community. So now, please take it away, Frank. Thank you very much, Linda. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce two professionals, two men that I've enjoyed communicating with. Uh, first person I'm going to introduce is Averill Strasser, who is the co-founder, COO, and general counselor of Water Charity, a California-based 501c3 nonprofit that implements water, sanitation, public health, and environmental projects worldwide. Founded in 2008, 6,000 projects have been completed in 78 countries, serving 6 million. The current programming of Water Charity is largely focused in West Africa. The Water for Everyone initiative is a border-to-border -border strategy to bring access to safe water as defined by the UN Sustainable Development Goal 6 to every person in Liberia, Togo, and the Gambia. Um, then we're gonna have John Kaufman. He's the director of H2O Open Doors, uh, affiliated with Rotary International. Rotary is the world's first social network and today, Rotary holds the highest consultative status offered to non-governmental organizations by the United Nations Economic and Social Council. Last year, John was invited to speak at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in the Vatican for Global Sustainability Network Conference on Modern Slavery and Sex Trafficking. His talk was about combining clean water for all by 2030 with gainful employment for all and an end to human trafficking and forced labor. As John says, when you create water enterprises run by women, you raise them in, into the middle class, empowering them towards self-reliance and enhanced dignity. Each purification plant would be run by five women who currently are vulnerable, exploited, and marginalized. First of all, we're gonna start with Averill. Averill, I'll let you explain what your program is. Thank, uh, thank you, Linda. Thanks for inviting me. I'm going to share my screen here. Starting out, as Frank mentioned, we're a California-based organization. We've been in business since 2008. We're in Southern California. And as Frank mentioned, we've been operating all over the world in 78 countries. And uh, we have helped 6,000 people gain access to clean water. Our general method of operation during most of those 12 years has been to use the activities of Peace Corps volunteers who are serving in the field, to do water projects and fund and provide technical assistance to those volunteers to implement them. Several years ago, we became partner with the National Peace Corps Association. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Bolivia, 1966 through 1968, and have kept up with returned volunteers. Have been a member of the National Peace Corps Association since that time. The Peace Corps itself has 7,400 approximately volunteers in the field at any point in time. Unfortunately, they were all evacuated due to the COVID virus on March 16th of this year, and to date they have not returned. 
the director, Jody, Jody Olson, has said that um, there will, will be a group going out probably in January to uh, as a test run to see whether the Peace Corps can uh, resurface in the world. So everybody who serves in the Peace Corps becomes a member of the National Peace Corps Association. To date, there are 240,000 returned Peace Corps volunteers belonging to that organization. It considered a, as an alumni group uh, for Peace Corps volunteers. NPCA has 150 affiliate groups of which uh, the Northern California Volunteers Association, Peace Corps Volunteers Association that Frank is very active in, uh, belong to and appreciate that uh, this opportunity to be on this panel with Frank, as was mentioned, he was a volunteer in Cote d'Ivoire, another country in West Africa. And uh, we have our eye on West Africa, on, on the Ivory Coast as well for expansion that we're gonna be doing. Um, so the evolution was to do a lot of projects all around the world. Over the last two years, we decided to start a Water for Everyone initiative in West Africa. And we, we picked out a few countries that we wanted to work in. And we started out in Liberia. We joined with an organization called The Last Well that had started up and, and gained the support of uh, 12 other organizations to take on an, a, a task to bring water to everybody in an entire country border to border. It sounds incredible and I'll talk about how that's gonna work later on. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Liberia now, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, Togo, which is, will be our second country, and uh, the Gambia, which is our third country. And I'll come back to the, the Gambia and focus on that as an example uh, of how this entire process works. It's just not enough time to, to show you all of those. Uh, suffice it to say, to set the, um, the parameters a little bit, the very last project that we're doing in Liberia in coordination with the other organizations um, is uh, our, our two communities or two cities at this point, 49,000 people, Carysburg and Todi. We just completed those. In Liberia, we're set to end this by 2020. Over the last five years, we brought water to everybody in Liberia, which is an amazing task. When we, uh, a couple of years ago, we decided, okay, let's keep this going. And Water Charity decided that we wanted to move on and take on uh, another country or two using the same model. So let's talk about what we do with water for everyone. Sustainable development goal number six talks about clean water and sanitation for all people. And the definition of, of that they provide is to give basic supply of potable water to every person in the, in the country or in every person in, in the area that, that's being looked at. And we decided that we would take on uh, Togo and the Gambia, and we set the deadline for 2023. How did we do that? So Liberia has about 5 million people, and we figured we would have enough resources to, to double that. And so starting from scratch in 2019, we took on the Gambia with a population of 2.2 million, and uh, Water for Everyone Togo was started with uh, 8.2 million population. So, um, and these maps obviously are not uh, to scale because Togo is much bigger than the Gambia, but we'll leave it at that. And um, so starting out, what's important for, for this kind of thing is to have stakeholders. Government stakeholders are extremely important. And uh, so we take two trips a year back to Washington DC for advocacy for the Peace Corps budget. During that time, we stop off at the embassies of Togo and the Gambia, bring them up to date as to what we're doing, gain their support, and uh, and our, and that, in that way, we're able to make sure that we are welcome in those countries we can, and, the, and that there's recognition given to the continued work that we're doing. So, um, going on to Togo, I'm not going to take much time other than to give you just a little bit of a flavor of what we're we're doing in Togo. Um, this is a GIS map. We use a, a geographic information system that'll be further explained in the snippets that we've gotten from the country directors. And um, so I'm not going to spend much time on other than to say that, uh, for example, here's a map that we keep up in real time. All of the data is entered, entered and is accessible in real time. These dots um, represent clusters of towns. 
And just to give you an example, we started in the maritime region and completed that very quickly. We wound up uh, uh, completing a, an assessment of the water needs of all of the uh, district of, of, uh, of Togo. Uh, within 2019, we actually beat our goal and did it way less than a year that we had. Uh, so we're finished with the assessment in Togo. There are six districts of 763 villages with a population of about 900,000. And um, well, I'm gonna kind of move on uh, to, uh, to tell you about what we do after we finish the assessment. And I'll use Togo as an example. We identified um, a need for 6,400 projects serving 3 million people, which is 34, 8% of the population. The, the major cities uh, are taken care of by the municipalities, or the, I'm sorry, by the federal government. So that includes uh, about 2,500 new wells. We have announced that we will do this by the end of 2023. We've got four more years to go after the assessment that has been co completed. So new wells and boreholes, a well rehabilitation, water filters. Water filters are the easy ones which are less expensive. Rehabilitation, we have crews we trained to do rehabilitation. About 40% of the wells are not working. And then new wells and boreholes, obviously, that's uh, quite a bit more expensive. So I'm going to start out. I'm going to introduce you to Emily Lundberg, who is our uh, country director in the, in the Gambia. And, uh, and, and she will introduce you to Rama Morang, who is uh, uh, the program coordinator in. Um, in the Gambia, we'll explain more about how it is that we carry this out on the ground. I wish they were here. It's the middle of the night there, so that we have to be satisfied, I guess, with them submitting uh, these um, snippets. Hi, so I'm here to give you an extremely short overview of our assessment of the Gambia. Uh, my name is Emily Lundberg. I am country director of water charity, the Gambia. So our Water for Everyone, the Gambia um, assessment strategy was dictated by the five administrative regions of the Gambia. Um, our survey entailed covering all those areas not served by the National Water and Electric Company, which is about 60% of the population. Um, and you can see here that some of the large towns are, are served by NAWEC. Um, to conduct our geographic information system water survey, so that is our GIS water survey, we combine the use of old technologies um, such as person-to-person -person, um, surveying. Here is our surveyors on the motorbikes. With the new technology of GPS-enabled smart tablets that were loaded with our surveys, you can see here on the right, um, Smart tablets that can communicate with satellites in even the most remote areas in the Gambia. So our surveyors visited all of the rural public wells in the country to assess their issues, speaking with locals about their water situation. So region by region, my Gambian counterpart and Brian Mamarong, who you will meet in one moment. Um, set up the smart tablets, train the surveyors in their use, oversaw the survey taking, and then um, returned to his home in the capital where he had internet, where he could upload all of the data to the GIS cloud. Um, first, they conducted the survey of the Central River region, next, the Upper River region, um, third, the North Bank region, fourth, the Lower River region, and then finally, the West Coast division, um, at least those portions not served by NAWIC. So the total population served at, surveyed ended up covering an area that served roughly 72% of Gambians, um, a population made up of 1,635 communities. Okay, now we're going to move on to uh, I'll introduce you to Rima. Why? Hello, everyone. I am Ibrahim Mamaro. I'm program manager of Water Charities Water for Everyone initiative in the Gambia. While initially Emily and I met with many of the primary wash stakeholders, it can be seen 
that uh, my job is to maintain those relationships as well as to pursue new angles of cooperation. Here we are at the Department of Water Resources in Banjul, the Gambia, with the head of rural water, Mr. Alaji Jabi, and his right hand man, Omar Jaju. Here again at the Department of Water Resources with Mr. Alaji Jabi, showing off our signed memorandum of understanding. Here at the Gambia's Department of Water Resources, where they even joke about giving me a desk because I am there too often. <laughs> Here I am meeting with uh, Dr. Baji at the Department of um, National, sorry, at the National Environment Agency. Here I am with the Department of Community Development. Here I am also with the Department of Health, one of the ladies who is a traditional bad attendant. So we, we work closely also with the Department of Health in the Gambia. In all the important local governments, including traditional chiefs and villages, like village elders, it's very important to have a strong, solid coordination with them. Here I am with um, the traditional village leaders, uh, also with Emily, as you can see in the photo. I also maintain relationships with large organizations like the African Development Bank. Okay, hey, now we're going to move on to a short snippet uh, ex explaining how the survey was done. Hello, everyone. It's Ibrahim Marong again, Water Charities Program Manager for the Gambia Water for Everyone Initiative. A lot of my most rewarding work as program manager has been working with our surveyors for all five sets of surveyors before we send them out to their respective regions. I taught each in the art of GIS data collection using GPS enabled smart tablets. The training is intense and can take several days, including the important skill of connecting with satellites in order to correctly record a site's correct GPS global positioning systems coordinates, yeah. Here I am training the Central, Central River Region surveyors before they go out to the field. The mapping process is as much about the map as a product as it is about the process of building local capacity and strengthening Gambian watch networks. We began our survey of the Gambia in December 2018 in the Central River region. We finished in October 2019. We recruited for each region. Again, each region has a survey team, a total of five teams. This is the West Coast region survey team. This picture was taken right after the completion of the training exercise. This is the lower river region survey team. And as you can see, I am in the, all these photos as well with the surveyors. This is the North Bank region survey team. And I'm really happy with the North Bank region survey team that um, it includes a lot of women. The water committees are important in all community development, and now Prime is going to tell us a little bit about how um, community by community we're able to get the support of the people on the ground, not only to determine their needs, but also to uh, assist with the implementation. Hello again, it's Ibrahim Maro, Program Manager, Water Charities, um, Water for Everyone Initiative in the Gambia. The other element of my work as program manager is to develop uh, or is developing water projects and uh, facilitating the formation of village water committees 
as part of that, I work to make sure that women are part of the water decision making process. It is very important that that gets done, particularly given the board in their often beer fetching water for domestic duties. Here you can see in this picture, um, a woman in the back, sitting at the back, like in a meeting dominated by men at the village of Antaba or Square. So she's not having a say, for example, in the whole water process or water decision making activity in the village. And um, it is very important that we always let villages take ownership of the water project so that, uh, so that way they can appreciate the positive impact that uh, it has on them. To form the water committee, the committee, oh sorry, the community must elect a six member water management committee headed by a president. We make sure that at least three women are members. We advise them to open a bank account in a nearby local town so each household can contribute a monthly token towards the maintenance of the water system. We work closely with every regional water directorate, which provides the legal framework and the paperwork. The Water Management Committee is obliged to transparently present the monthly collection at the village Bantaba or the village square. This is where usually decisions regarding the village is made. And in a meeting coordinated by the head of the village called the Alcalo traditionally. The Water Management Committee is obliged to transparently present the monthly collection at the village Bantaba which is also called the village choir in a meeting coordinated by the head of the village or the Alcalo, as I mentioned. I hope that was informative for you and uh, I want to leave some time for questions at the end. So I'll stop here and uh, want to just mention that uh, your support in terms of um, connections with other people who may be interested in the work that we're doing in West Africa and the ability to be able to join in this, uh, I call it a world shattering new model for community development throughout the world. If you have any particular questions, our water site is watercherry.org. And I may be reached directly at Averill, A V E R I L L, at watercherry.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Averill. I'd like to introduce uh, now John Kaufman, who's going to explain to, him what he, to us what he does. Uh, so take it away, John. Well, first of all, I'm just blown away by Water Charity. I mean, they are the gold standard in West Africa. We don't work in West Africa. We work in East Africa and other places, but I'm just so impressed. I, I love um, seeing this and um, and uh, kudos to you. I'd also like to say that we are, H Open Doors is a project of Rotary. We're not a 501c3. We're a project of Rotary clubs. And I'm pleased to say that Rotary has formed a partnership with the Peace Corps. And we just can't wait to see what, 2021, as soon as we get released from bondage, uh, to see how that um, collaboration works. Um, H2O Open Door is a funny name. Uh, it is uh, H2O meaning water technologies. We provide water purification technologies to villages and schools in developing countries. And the Open Doors uh, is talking about opportunity. The the water that we're producing out of these plants, out of these water plants is robust enough that it can provide an enterprise for the village to sell the water and then go towards self-reliance. What we are probably more than a water organization is a self-reliance organization. So let's look at the next slide. Um, we've done 33 plants in 11 countries. Now each one of these water plants has the capacity to give 10,000 people two liters of drinking water every single day. The quality of the water is at US EPA standards or better. We think it's very important that um, well water, even any kind of random well water be purified for human consumption. We'll go to the next slide. 
I wrote a book about our adventures. We've got we've taken about 500 Rotarians and friends on these adventures throughout the uh, throughout the world in the last eight years. And I wrote a book called Long Walk on a Dry Road. And as you can see on the on the front cover, we have a couple of Indian women walking with 40 pounds of water on their heads. Most NGOs, and 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 I and I and I don't know um, if this is the case with Water Cherry because they're they're just too good, but most NGOs um, operate with um, water points. And the women, you'll see everywhere you go, you'll see women walking literally with 40 pounds of water on their heads for like five miles a day. Um, they don't have an opportunity for um, enterprise or to take care of their kids during the day. And as a matter of fact, a lot of them are susceptible to rape and um, brutality. So uh, one of the first things we wanted to disrupt with uh, water NGOs and the way that it was being done was we wanted to take the women off the road, let them go back to school, let them start enterprises. Because what we want to do is instead of bringing people to the water point, we want to bring the water to the people. And I'll describe how that works. We can go on. So this is a, I own a marketing company in the Silicon Valley. And sometimes when you want to explain a complex topic, it's, it's a lot of fun to do it by cartoon. So this is a short animation that describes our technology and our approach. So let's play it. In the world's poorest communities, the cost of bottled water is out of reach, let alone education, nutritional programs, and electricity. But with a little technology and a whole lot of soul, H2 Open Doors can transition communities out of generational poverty in as little as a year. We provide villages with an ultra-filtration system that turns contaminated water into drinking water that is 99.999% microbiologically pure. Each Sunspring hybrid uses over five miles of membrane strands to remove all bacteria, cysts, and viruses. The new Sunspring can produce up to 10 gallons of water per minute, 24 hours a day, using zero fuel, electricity, or chemicals with no cost of operation. Rotary clubs in the region mentor the village as they use Sunspring to launch a sustainable water bottling enterprise that can generate over 100,000 US dollars per year. Community members also learn to care for the equipment and receive microfinancing for items like family water bottles and sanitation supplies. Imagine the dignity and self-reliance that comes from quickly learning a business that helps to pay for their own education, healthcare, and more. To learn more and even participate in our expeditions, find us on Facebook and visit h2opendoors.org. Okay, we could go to the next slide. So this happens to be a picture of one of four installations that we've got in Puerto Rico. And we put, the, we put the purified water into these polycarbonate bottles, much like uh, what you would find on your water cooler. Um, we don't want to have purified water go into those funky jerry cans that you see all over the place. Um, the, the water that you're pulling out of a well is not purified. So to put it into a contaminated container is not a big deal. But in this case, we're purifying the water. As in the cartoon, it showed that it's a membrane-based system. And think of membranes as uh, 25,000 strands of angel hair pasta. They're hollow all the way through these strands. And along the sides are a billion holes. And these pores are smaller than a bacteria, a virus, a cyst. And as water is pressurized in the sunspring, it's pushed against these membranes. The pure water gets through. It's ultrafiltration, not RO. So it'll maintain the electrolytes that are, the, that are in the water, but it'll take out the toxic um, particulates. And they gather on the outside of the membranes and the system has an automatic back flush that'll, that'll um, clean out uh, uh, automatically several times a day. You take the system down for, one, uh, 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 for 90 minutes, one time a month, to do some manual cleaning of the pre-filters and so on, but the system is, automatic and it's self, uh, self cleaning. And these 20 liter bottles or 18.9 liter bottles, depending on where you're going, make the water portable. So it almost doesn't matter where 
the water source is, we set up delivery systems and we teach the village to have a little business, hire some of the, some of the folks to actually distribute to every hut, every house, every school, every community center, every clinic throughout the village, as opposed to having wa uh, women walking all day with water on their heads. Next slide. The inside of the Sun Spring looks like this. The, the blue filter uh, uh, housing is actually one of the pre-filters, one of four pre-filters, and that's not replaceable. Uh, none of them are replaceable. There's virtually no cost of operation. Um, it's a stainless steel mesh pre-filter. And then the, the big column uh, there is, is the membrane housing, and that's a guaranteed 10-year housing. The oldest systems out in the field are 13 years old and there's never been a need for a membrane housing, which is the most expensive component to be replaced in the field. And those, those are made for the Sunspring factory by Suez, which used to be GE Water and Power. Next slide. So what we were trying to go after is, the, is a force multiplier approach. If you combine clean water and sanitation, number six of the SDG goals, with number eight, which is decent work and economic growth for all by the year 2030. In other words, if you create water enterprises, you have a force multiplier that actually touches on all the other 15 goals. So we'll go to the next slide. And in the process, what you're doing when you set up these water enterprises, largely run by women, is you're able to raise the women into the status of middle class within a year. And this is really what we're talking about. We're talking about self-reliance and raising and elevating women and others who are marginalized. Next slide, please. Now, the Maasai Mara is a great example. Last year, we went to the Maasai Mara uh, last summer and uh, we were going on game drives uh, uh, and we were having a great time, of course, after we had done installations in another part of Africa. And we witnessed this is how water is sold. Um, they have six of these uh, donkey carts and they scrape the water out of the river and they sell the water for 20 cents or 20 shill Kenyan shillings um, for a container. So one penny a liter and they sell that at market. Next one. Um, we talked to the Maasai men and the Maasai men uh, described something horrific that had happened about uh, uh, three weeks before we had gotten there. This woman was reenacting for our camera. She was reenacting what happened to her sister. This is a borehole made by an elephant in the dry riverbed. What the elephants do is they come in, they stamp down, they use their tusks and they make this beautiful borehole. And when it rains, it fills up with water. Well, that's for the elephant. And her sister was doing what she's recreating and the elephant charged through the bush and trampled her to death. So when you're competing for water sources with wildlife, that's the kind of life that they live every single day. So the men asked us, what can H2 Open Doors do to solve this problem once and for all? And so what we said was, well, we'll create a water plant for you, like we've done in other parts of Kenya and Tanzania and so on. Um, and we'll do that. We'll, we'll raise the funds because H2 Open Doors is part of Rotary, which is a charity. We'll raise the funds and we'll contribute that, no problem. We have two conditions. The first condition is you have to sell the water because that's how we'll maintain that it's a sustainable system. And we want you to be able to fund all your other social service needs as opposed to continually giving us punch lists of can you, can you raise money for this? Can you raise money for that? No, you can raise your own money through water sales. And in particular, they can sell some of the luxury base camps around the Mara with purified water, water of US EPA quality in these five gallon bottles. And the model here is a plant that we, that we created. It was about $60,000. Uh, we put in a 650 foot borehole. We sunk a submersible solar pump into it, which fills the tanks constantly, keeps these tanks constantly filled with raw water. We draw the water through the sun spring to purify it and send the purified water into a bottling building. So we had to build this building. On top of the building is the solar panels that operate that solar pump. Uh, as we sanitize the bottles before every use, and by the way, these five gallon bottles can be used 100 times. Um, they replace 3,400 single use um, uh, water bottles and they're family size bottles and they get sanitized before we fill them 
each time. If a village sells just half of the capacity, the system has the capacity to do 1,000 of these five gallon bottles every single day. If they were able to sell just 50% of those at three cents a liter, remember that river water was one cent a liter. If they can sell this purified water for three cents a liter every single day, 50% of the capacity, that's 100,000 US dollars a year. That is transformable, tran uh, transformational um, uh, funding. The big condition that we gave to the men of the Tamara besides setting up an enterprise like this was that the women had to run it. And they gulped on that one. That was tough because the money that it's going to be creating for them is something that if the men were running it and deciding how to spend the money, they'd buy a cow. If the women are running it, they're going to buy education, they're going to buy classroom expansions, health, nutrition programs, and even college scholarships to send some of the kids to Nairobi University. Next. And this is the women of the Maasai Mara water program. These five women bottle the water, uh, sanitize the bottles, bottle the water, and then they hire the men to distribute it all over the Mara. Next one. And this is their brand, and Kari Sedai. In the Ma language, this means um, purified water. Next one. And they distribute it in trucks. They distribute it all sorts of different ways. Next one. And we're even talking about in a lot of the new villages that we're gonna be working with, providing them with an electric bike that can carry the cargo. Next one. In Guatemala, we put this on a roof of a municipality and another one at a hospital. Um, this is what it looks like. And this is a wall spring. So while the sun spring um, landed is about $25,000 doing 20,000 liters uh, every single day, it works out to be about a 10th of a penny a gallon if you amortize that cost. The wall spring can go in with all the guts of the system, except for installations where they have electricity and they have water pressure. If we have that, we can put the wall spring in for about $11,000. Next one. And this has all been done in the charity model. Rotary is one of the oldest charities. It's about 120 years old, I think. Uh, we've got um, 35,000 Rotary clubs in more countries than the UN has uh, a, a presence and uh, about uh, 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 1.2 million members. So it's worked well. However, one of the things that I know Water Charity is faced with, every NGO, every charity in the, in the world is faced with chasing the donor dollar. That donor dollar is becoming less and less and less available. And it's really causing a pinch, especially after COVID. For every $1 that's available to a charitable organization like Water Charity or Rotary, there are thousands of dollars available as investment. Next one. So we're going after social impact investment now. And we formed a Delaware Public Benefit Corporation called Global Water First. It's called Global Water First because you just start with water. We're, we've got ambitions to go even further. Next. Next slide. And we want to create water and power hubs. It turns out that a lot of places we go, we wait for big infrastructure to provide power. And we, we determined that if you really want to create self-reliance, if you really want to build um, that self-reliance amongst the village, water is just the, the start. You start with water. That's why it's called global water first. What comes after that is power. Because if you really want to provide opportunity, you need to create power for everybody's homes and for um, a business incubator where they can actually begin to start businesses and create skill sets. This is a, this is a uh, pictogram of what we're gonna be putting in, in uh, July, we start, we're starting in April, in the Naka Valley Refugee Settlement in Uganda. Now you wonder, how can you have an enterprise in a place like a refugee center where they have no money? Well, this is how this works. Um, in this particular water and power hub, we're gonna be putting in a solar farm. That's gonna be going into a power building with a battery um, that will uh, uh, provide the power during the night. It will power uh, 100 homes being put in by the UNHCR for this carve out in the Naka Valley refugee settlement for new refugees from the Congo in this particular case. We'll also be able to power a school and community center, the business incubator where 
these refugees can start businesses because they'll have power. We have the water plant, the water bottling building, the borehole, and, and so on. This whole smart water and power hub is what we're going to be putting in all over the world. Next one. In the water plants, we can also daisy chain capacity. So this is this is basically, it's actually four daisy chained wall springs. So while one wall spring can do the same as a sun spring, 20,000 liters a day, when you daisy chain them together based on what you need, you can do 20,000, 40,000, 60,000, 80,000 and up. Next one. And you can even be filling, in this particular case, it's filling an 85,000 gallon tank for a community. Next. So the sale of water pays for the cost of power. So even though the refugees, for instance, and, and remember, if we can put this in a refugee center where they have no money, we can put it anywhere where they do have maybe $2 a day that they're earning. Uh, the sale of water pays for the cost of power. They can, uh, they, that allows us to be able to put in the infrastructure and all of it is a revenue stream where we're charging a little bit of, uh, of money for the leaders processed. We're charging about 18, kilo, uh, 18 cents per kilowatt hour for the power that's being consumed, all on smart power hubs. These are, these are um, automate, automated and manually overrided smart power hubs to prevent crashes. Because one of the things that, that, that we've been learning is that a lot of power hubs that go in are not smart nano grids. And so that's what we use. And in addition, we can put in through satellite technology, we can put in village wide internet, uh, a one gigabyte download for the entire village for very inexpensive amount. And this is what we're doing in the public parks in Guatemala with a dish like this, which has a one and a half mile radius. It'll serve one and a half miles with Wi-Fi, wireless Wi-Fi. Next. So the world's largest refugee camp by land size is, is the Naka Valley. Next. And they even had a, have a Rotaract club. Rotaractors are young Rotarians and they have a Rotaract club at this refugee center. Next. And we're motivated collaborators. Um, we would love to collaborate with all sorts of different NGOs and the Peace Corps and so on. We do this all the time. Global Water First is motivated by meeting the sustainability goals. The impact investor is motivated by getting a return of their capital plus dividends. And the village utility is motivated to get a provision of water and power. Our operator is a light foundation, which is another NGO, and they're going to be on the ground with the UNHCR uh, conducting all the, all the security and provisions there. So the sale of water pays for the cost of power. Next. Well, thank you very much, both panel members, uh, Averill and John. We have time for a few questions um, that you may have gone over, but I'm going to start with the very first question that we got this evening. Um, what kind of communication methods have you found most effective in getting important messages to local populations, such as the need to use only sanitized containers? Uh, let's start with Averill first. Communications for us is going to the village directly. We We've gone to thousands of villages and gathered information as to who the village leaders are and what their needs and problems are. And we're able to uh, work very closely with them. So the needs come back to us, the work is done, and it's all very much coordinated. We have um, started during COVID, uh, increased our emphasis on uh, sanitation, hand washing, and hygiene, something which we hadn't done. It's kind of an add on to clean water important that on, but uh, we were easily able to start that up because communications were so good. Uh, the contacts that we had were so good. Thank you. John, uh, you've mentioned about uh, uh, sanitized containers. How do you get that message out? Well, we, in, in the water enterprises, we're controlling the container that they can get and the bottling uh, session like maybe they're doing a hundred bottles at once to create these bottles, they're sanitized beforehand. We don't want them using jerry cans because this okay. is purified water and purified water is very fragile. We don't want that water recontaminating. Okay, I have a question for Averill. You mentioned small monthly fees in the villages. Can you tell us how much that would be? Well, we're a charity 
we will work toward uh, the scale that John works on, but basically we start out by providing these basic services at no cost. Obviously there's buy-in and when somebody pays even a few pennies for access to clean water, they do appreciate it more. So we're talking about uh, uh, pennies per liter. The kind of technology that we use is, uh, is quite basic. We call it appropriate technology for the small villages. We don't offer it anywhere uh, in any bigger areas. We leave that to the, to the bigger organizations. In the small um, communities where we operate and we try to provide water systems so that nobody has to walk any further than 15 minutes. And that's, that's pretty primitive. But anyway, we, so we still have people going to gather their own water. And so that kind of service is provided without charge. When we get a, a more difficult situation that costs money, we'll build in a, a few cents a liter. Okay. Um, John, how did you overcome the resistance to women's leadership? You know, it, it, in the case of the Maasai Mara, it was fascinating because um, we had a long conversation with the men. Uh, they had just lost, they just had an elephant kill a woman, right? So it was their, their wake-up call. And they wrote an, M we asked them to write a, 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 um, write up a document, an MOU in, in effect, that all the elders of the community, it's about 20,000 people um, uh, uh, in the Mara. And um, one, of the, one of the things that they wrote, it was fascinating, uh, you know, it was, came out of our conversation was, isn't it interesting that the Maasai people are here to prevent the uh, destruction of wildlife and the, the end of, of certain species. And yet the, the Maasai people themselves are susceptible to extinction as well. And why? It's because the women are marginalized. We need all minds, all brains, all adults, hands on deck. And so they recognized in their MOU that in order to really um, go forward and create an environment in which people want to stay in that culture, which is a which is a, a nomadic culture, um, that they um, that they honor the women and elevate the women, and that's what they're doing. Okay, I have a follow-up question to that. Um, how long was the training program for these women to run the, the system? Uh, well, we were there for two days installing it. it. Took us about two days to install the whole plant, and then the tr the training is ongoing. We have technicians that do the services, but a lot of them want to learn how to do the service every month as well. So they've been learning as they go on. We always have stakeholders involved, technicians, trained technicians, um, but the women are just, they're just like, you know, they, they're pitching in, they're being honored, they're being, they're being elevated, they're being appreciated, and every aspect of that plant they want to be involved in. Okay, uh, this question is for both of you. Uh, what kind of literacy issues do you run into? Mm, good question. Take, take that away, Ava. We, we find that a, an issue. Okay, that is important. And uh, so I want to tie this in with the girls thing. Uh, we were working with Peace Corps on the Let Girls Learn program. It was started under the Obama administration by Michelle Obama. And uh, the, the Peace Corps played a big part and we worked, as I said, with Peace Corps volunteers. And um, of course, uh, we were the first ones to show the tie between water, access to water and staying in school. Mm -hmm. So we, we wound up becoming the biggest funders of that program, uh, of the Peace Corps' participation in that program by um, building uh, access to water, be it water systems, pumps, wells, and sanitation like latrines. And we found that uh, that alone was enough to keep girls in school because girls uh, have the largest uh, part of the task of gathering water for a family. And if a girl can uh, cut off two hours of going to fetch water, she's able to stay in school. So, um, and, and we, of course, going forward, see women as being the, the leaders. Uh, any, anybody who works in this field agrees uh, they handle the money better, they step forward and do the work better. That, that's true. Yeah, the, the, the women are, are um, best at running these enterprises because they're cooperative as opposed to being competitive, you know. 
but yeah, what like our mantra is water, education, peace. You know, they're they're all linked. They're all part of the same thing. Um, I have a question for both of you. Do the governments where you go, do they keep track of the increased health because people are drinking pure water and not getting waterborne diseases? Oh, we do that. We build that into our system. So we we gather baseline data in every one of the communities that we visit. Uh, we do tests as to whether they have uh, diarrhea or any kind of gastrointestinal illness. And we, if we put in filtration, we go back after a month, two months, six months, a year. We actually follow this through for two years. We use a, a smaller uh, household filtration system, nothing on the scope that, uh, that John is talking about. And for us, that works really well. And we're finding that we're able to bring gastrointestinal illness from 40 or 50 percent down to about two percent just by something as simple as filtration. Wow. Yeah. You know what's interesting about that, Averill, is is um, there's so much misinformation. Like I was having a conversation, and, and I hear this all over. Um, that you know, I'll ask. I'll be at a dinner party with somebody, and um, I, I never get invited again because I'm always asking questions about diarrhea, right? <laughs> so I asked this one person who runs a, a, a World Health Organization within, within uh, Africa, and I said, tell me about the diarrhea in your village, you know, with the, with the children, because it affects children under five more than, you know, people our age. But then when you get over 70, you know, it's about your immune system, right? And she said, well, we know why the kids get uh, diarrhea. I said, well, why? He said, because they're teething. And I said, so you're saying saliva causes the diarrhea? And she said, yes. I said, you know, that's not true. You know, the truth is they're, they're transitioning from mother's milk from the breast to water. You're giving them water. The water you're giving them is contaminated with uh, bacteria. Their immune system isn't, isn't strong enough to be able to handle that. And so that's why uh, about 1,800 children under the age of five die every single day Yesterday, today, tomorrow, of uh, of of diarrhea because of what's because of the water that they're drinking. So there's a lot of misinformation out there that you know, and, and an educational curve that we have to uh, work on all the time as well. Um, I noticed that both of you sign uh, memorandums of understanding. Yes. You work with the government at various levels. Um, do you ever find difficulty in working with local governments? regional governments, any of those? Avery, we'll start with you first. Yeah, we build that into all of our models. We have sign off at every single level from the community, be it a 250 household community to a 2000 household uh, village. And uh, we get sign offs at that level on the district level, the regional level, and sign offs by at the, at the national level, which is most important. We, uh, in Liberia, we were able to last year go back to Liberia for the penultimate year going into the 2020 uh, with one year left to go. And the president of Liberia hosted us for a, a luncheon and a, a very, very large community operation to give support, to give us, to thank us for what we did, give us support going into the last year and encourage us to raise enough money to finish on time. And it looks like we're doing it. That's wonderful. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I mean, that's the most important thing. I think when you're, when you're building enterprises that provide for self-reliance of a village, that's, that's less pressure on a provincial government, you know, the governor of a province or whatever. Um, they know that they're being able to support themselves and that's less draw from the, from the coffers um, at the provincial government. So we get we get as high up as we possibly can within the region to sign off on the MB, MOU and become stakeholders. Okay, I have a question. I guess it's more about politics. Um, our country, notwithstanding or anything, um, do you find that by providing more water for people that it provides more political or in social stability? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the areas where we operate, uh, there's, they're not too involved with politics. So uh, that really doesn't pertain. We stay out of the cities where the politics are really important. And uh, but, um, Yeah, that's sure really you. true. In the urban areas, it's a different environment. In these rural areas, you know, there's been improvement. Uh, you know, when we had the millennial goals, right, from 
from 2000 to 2015, I think, Avril. Mm -hmm. uh, we had great improvement in a lot of these measures and we cut in half the rates of diarrhea, for instance. But all of that improvement was in the urban areas. It really wasn't in these rural areas. These, these areas, these ag areas, these rural areas um, where you've got you know, 2,000, 10,000, even 100,000 people, they've been left out of all of the improvement unless an organization like Water Charity comes in and, inter and intercedes and, um, and, or intervenes. And so um, we're actually seeing um, a, a real slide back on progress in the rural communities that don't have any in intervention. Hmm. Okay. Uh, languages are important around the world. And having lived in Cote d'Ivoire, I think there was something like 72 different languages. How do you deal with, I, I, I've been to Togo, they have many languages, uh, the Gambia, et cetera. How do you deal with the, the variety of languages? Well, let me start out in Liberia. I couldn't believe they speak English, but uh, it's really, really hard to understand. It's a pidgin English, but uh, and, and Togo, we purposely chose uh, Togo and the Gambia. It was one of the factors uh, we wanted to be involved in a French speaking country and, and, uh, and an English speaking country. And of course, there are the, the, the dialects and this situation to get, to get through. All of our workers on the ground are locals. We, we don't have any Americans working there going. And uh, we, we partner with other organizations in each of the regions. So if there's a country with five regions, um, we'll, there'll be different crews that are dealing with the people who have a better uh, feeling for the local languages. Yeah, that's right. In, in our case, in the on the charity model of H2 Open Doors within Rotary, you know, we're working very closely with with members of Rotary clubs that live within the region. A lot of them have come from the villages, the very villages that we're putting it in, and they've they've moved on to Nairobi or wherever it might be, Kampala, depending on where we are, and most of them speak English, um, and you know, and the culture, and they're business owners and community leaders. Um, so we haven't really had a had a language problem per se, because we have enough people that we're coordinated with that speak English, but yet know, know the uh, local languages as well. Um, and knowing what you both do and knowing how valuable it is to the community, uh, is the technology something that, that's complicated to explain when you bring in, let's say a solar powered object or a, a, an electronic powered object. How do you explain to people who may not, I don't know, have, may not have seen a lot of that before? It's a good, good question. I, I'll answer from my point of view, Avril. From my point of view, um, it's the end product that we want to get them, that they're, that they're interested in. The solar and all the whiz bang and everything. Um, you know, some of them are fascinated by that and some of them aren't. We use the grandmother test. The grandmother test says that um, if you're going to do a project in Rotary, and this has been my hue and cry, um, would you have your grandmother get her water that way? Or would you have your grandma, like, a, like I, I, I always rail about the life straw, you know, the life straw is, you, you know, is, is that gadget where you stoop into a river and you suck river water through the straw and supposedly it's going to, you know, um, so it's not just about the technology, it's about dignity. We want to offer dignity to these people. They deserve it. Why not? We don't want to do something half-assed, like we, you know, just because um, they had nothing and now we give them something. That something ought to be uh, something that our grandmother we would want our grandmother to enjoy. So the technology is just a means to get to that end. Gotcha. So we have we have contact with plumbers and well drillers and all of that. The most complicated thing we usually do is a solar-powered uh, uh, borehole and. Uh, and that's fairly easy to, to maintain, and uh, the, there is access to parts and so on. Yeah. Technology is is pretty much not an issue for us on the on the level that, that we operate. Uh, we, in terms of filtration, as I mentioned, we, uh, when we come to a community and if we can do household uh, water filtration, we meet with every single family in the village, and they go through a half hour or an hour training on how to use this, how to maintain it. And uh, th that's all done by, by our teams. They just do it over and over again. It's, it's a large task, but once it's done once, it's reinforced when we go back after, after several months. And uh, if, if it's not, they, there's kind of like a, a little tune up as to what, they, what more information they need to keep things going. Okay. 
Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's program. I want to thank again the Commonwealth Club for putting together this important program. And a special thank you to our, our two speak, speakers, Gabriel Strasser and John Kaufman. I certainly uh, uh, appreciate all that you you do around the world. I appreciate you sharing your information. I've learned a lot just reading up on what you do. I have met Averill, Averill before, and I enjoyed what, what they do. I, I do have one, two final quick questions before I sign off. Uh, can anybody in this country volunteer to work with you? Uh, oh, absolutely. Overseas. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We, I, I had mentioned that we've taken 500 people on our adventures and we divide them up with different projects. We keep them busy. I like to call it um, uh, service, uh, service safari and soul. Um, and we really enjoy those volunteerism uh, experiences. Averill? In the old days, we used to do something like that, take people to show them the things. And uh, we haven't found a really good way to manage volunteers. It's like okay. kind of like herding cats. So we don't make much use of it. Having said that, uh, through the National Peace Corps Association, we have funded the projects of return Peace Corps volunteers to go back to their countries of service all over the world. In that respect, uh, uh, they're doing that as volunteer without pay. We pay for the materials, they do the projects. So that's a good level of volunteers that we're able to support. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you again very much. Uh, the club will soon be posting this video on its website at www.commonwealthclub.org. And I am Frank Price, and this club program is now concluded. Thank you, Frank. Uh, nice meeting you. Thank you. Wonder, wonderful meeting you, Averill. Thank you so much.